It was always more about Jim Plunkett's heart than his talent. Eight months after a tumor was removed from the Stanford freshman's neck, he rejected a suggestion that he switch from quarterback to defensive end. Four seasons later, the Heisman winner engineered an upset of number two Ohio State in the Rose Bowl. More difficulties awaited Plunkett in his 17 seasons in the NFL. Here is the no-frills, decidedly human story of one quarterback who didn't know the meaning of the word quit. Jim Plunkett, when he came in here to New England, that's the number one choice. Uh, they just moved into a new stadium. They were sort of using his publicity to help them sell that stadium. Expectations were huge. He had won the Heisman Trophy, and then he brought Stanford back to win the Rose Bowl game in 71. Jim Plunkett was, was a, wow, I got the number one pick, and we got the Heisman Trophy winner, and wow, look at him, he's 6'3", and he's a strong guy, and he ought to be great. Everyone in New England, you know, this is when Berserk, when they, when they got to draft him, uh, this was going to be the savior of the franchise. This was going to be their first great, great quarterback. When he came here, he was joining the most dysfunctional franchise in pro football history. Jim Plunkett was going to be the guy who reformed one of the preeminent clown colleges in the history of professional sports. You have to remember what the New England Patriots have been about. This is a team that once played a home game in Birmingham, Alabama. When he first got here, he wins the first game. He destroys the Oakland Raiders. I mean, it, was, <laughs> it was like all the dreams of, of every Patriot fan were coming true immediately because Jim Plunkett was here. That year, he played every down, every single play. He throws 19 touchdown passes. He's the uh, rookie of the year, you know, and things looked really good, except that the Patriots weren't spending money to make their team any better. After a promising 6-8 season in 1971, the Patriots slumped over the next four years, winning just 18 games. Suffering through three head coaches, the slow-footed Plunkett wandered alone on dangerous ground, unprotected and increasingly unappreciated. He absolutely got hammered. He had no offensive line in front of him. He was running from his life. The worst thing he did was have a great first year. And he did it just running around making plays on his own. Although Jim has a great arm, uh, he's got really slow feet. He's got the worst feet in the NFL. I kept notes on all the NFL quarterbacks. Uh, Fouts and Plunkett were guys that I kept in a similar category. I labeled them as targets, immobile. In 1973, a new head coach's attempt to retool Plunkett proved disastrous. When Chuck Fairbanks came here, he was a college coach with a college mentality. Well, I like the option, and we're going to make you run a little bit more. Well, there couldn't have been a more plow horse guy than Jim Plunkett. He could do a lot of things with the football, but run with it wasn't one of them. And so there was instant conflict there between coach and quarterback. Jim was scared of Fairbanks trying to put in a wishbone. When we got down on the goal line, we even ran a couple of wishbone plays, and Jim just did not like that because, let's face it, it was almost showcasing his weakness. He was a down-to-earth, simple guy who didn't say much. In some respects, that may have worked against him because had he spoken up, especially when Chuck Fairbanks showed up, that might have put him in a better position. He clearly reached a point where he didn't feel he was safe anymore dropping back to pass uh, in New England. And once that happened, his game began to drop off and his confidence dropped off. Jim was slow, he was hurt. You could tell that, that there was no fire in the oven. New England's a tough place for a guy to be a star. They have a tendency in New England to eat their own. And Plunkett was one of those players. He was clearly their best player. Uh, yet he got eaten alive by the press and the fans who believed that it was his fault surgery upon surgery, separation of shoulder upon separation, knees, I mean, the team looked bad, and they wanted to get rid of him. In 1976, Plunkett was sent west, out of his New England nightmare. Jim suffered a lot. He had a broken psyche. When he finally ended up with the 49ers, he basically couldn't play football. That was a tough time for him when that happened because he had taken a pay cut and made some sacrifices to come out to the 49ers to be close to mom and the family, too. Coming back here to where I played college football, family, friends, weather, you name it, I was looking forward to coming to San Francisco. Jim comes to the 49ers and he's beaten up. He's throwing one hoppers. You know, he can't reach his receivers. They're coming to him on a bounce. 
they had bottomed out and Jim was their quarterback. And nobody thought Jim could play anymore and it only got worse. They were not the 49ers of the 80s, I'll say that. And uh, Plunkett came to town and he was injured. And I guess the, the, the best way to put it was, I looked forward to that weekend. He sat there and he saw nothing. And if he had a choice of throwing an interception or taking the sack, he took the sack. He ended up going through three coaches in two years, and, and things just went in the toilet after that. Plunkett's performances grew steadily worse as the 49ers went 13 and 15 in two seasons. It appeared the Bay Area's favorite son was washed up at 30. I felt like I was sinking lower and lower. As much as I wanted to be successful when I got back to the Bay Area, it was almost a relief to be let go. It was an awful experience for me. I just remember being at work, getting a phone call from him, telling me that he was released from the Niners and that things didn't look good. He was just totally lost. Maybe I'm not good enough anymore. Maybe I'm too beat up. Maybe I can't do the job. Uh, maybe it's time for me to do something else. To me, there was never a question, was he going to stop playing? It was, was he going to be in the right situation? At that point, he was really down and wasn't sure he'd sign with anyone. He had a couple offers, and he wasn't uh, at all convinced he'd continue. So I knew at that point his career may be over. Jim Plunkett was free. I mean, he was not only waived by the 49ers, but he was waived all, all the way through the league. I mean, no one claimed Jim Plunkett. In 1978, he wanted to quit football, and I said, you're not going to quit football. So I searched around and made contact with a number of clubs. When I was the head coach of Philadelphia and needed a backup, I actually brought him in when he was a free agent. And I ended up not signing him because I didn't want to be the person to cut him again. Nobody fell any harder. Nobody was expected to do more and, and disappointed more people and gave draft picks that were given up for him. I mean, he was a total washout. Born to William and Carmen Plunkett on December 5, 1947 in San Jose, California, Jim was the youngest of three children. My parents were blind, my mother totally, my father uh, legally, very, very poor vision. His parents met in a home for the blind in uh, New Mexico, fell in love, got married, and wanted to have a family, and all three children are sighted. They cared about their children, cared about providing for them. Uh, they had very little to give us, but what they did have, they, they shared with us. Bonded by adversity, the Plunkets persevered with next to nothing in a world that offers little to the physically impaired. My dad worked for the State Board of Equalization, which provided jobs for the handicap. He ran a candy and cigarette stand. I asked Jim, I said, did people steal from your dad in those little newspaper stands? And he said, sure. I'm sure they did. My mom literally nursed and, and fed us and clothed us and took care of us. She was an amazing woman, you know. Not being able to see, she uh, took care of a household like nobody else. If you called my mother handicapped, she'd smack you. Finances were minimal, and I remember he said that sometimes for dinner they'd have a ketchup sandwich. As I was growing up, we lived in Santa Clara, then we moved to downtown San Jose, then we moved to the east side of San Jose. Because as rents went up, my father had to keep finding lower and lower rents so that we could have a place to live. He helped raise his parents as much as they helped raise him. He had responsibilities at a younger age that many people never have. It was tough when they didn't have a car. It was tough to live on welfare. He didn't become a problem to anybody. I will admit, when I was a kid growing up, you know, I felt embarrassed by our situation, where we live, maybe about my family not being able to see some. But then as I got older and probably more mature, and, and I look back, they did such a wonderful job. You know anything about Jim's background? Jim had a burning desire to excel and to achieve greatness. And I think he wanted to do that more than just for himself, for his family, for his parents for other people in this community. It goes back again to the fact that he learned to endure hardship as a kid working with his parents. The hardship was part of life. That's something to be endured, to be overcome, and you keep on going. Equipped with a strong body and the will to endure, Plunkett excelled at sports. He was everybody's equal or superior in sports. Um, 
He was a very good wrestler. He was a, a decent basketball player. He played baseball, but he was a very good football player. In the summers uh, to James Lake High School, I, you know, I dropped back with my eyes closed, planned and thrown out and hit it. His mental attitude was the thing that maybe made him a little bit different. His mental attitude just pushed him past the limit of a lot of other kids. A five-sport athlete, Plunkett attracted college recruiters from across the country. But his allegiance to his family kept him close to home, but at a school that was a far distance from how he had grown up. Stanford was a neighborhood school. You know, it was 15 miles away and on the farm there, and Jim probably grew up just loving Stanford. And for him to go there, I mean, it's like putting a medal on his chest. On freshman orientation day, when they bring the parents into school, I sat next to his mom and dad. The family was extremely proud of Jim Plunkett, extremely proud of their son. Almost a little bit in awe, too, of Stanford and, and you know, the image that goes with it. Many of the kids there came from private schools. I felt out of place. I wasn't used to being away from home. It was very difficult for me to adjust. My first impression, Jim was the shyest guy in the world in those days. He was not very open and, and kind of difficult to talk to and, uh, and really shy as can be. He was a man of few words. He was just a little more stoic and it had nothing to do with arrogance. Just that was his personality. It was tough then to get in. But he did get in on his own. He took the SATs just like everybody else and scored high. He had a good grade point average. He was a Mexican-American coming out of East San Jose. And he earned his way there. Before Plunkett was able to adjust to Stanford's social environment, he was confronted with a far more serious problem. I went in for a physical. They found a lump in my throat, uh, took a radioactive iodine test back then, and uh, proved positive. And the doctor at the time did not give me a good prognosis. The scary part that I remember was that if it had been malignant, that the muscles in his neck and shoulder would have to be removed. Just prior to going to the operating room, he's, and I'm under anesthesia and he's got a scalpel and he's going up to my shoulder and up the side of my neck now i wake up and i've got the big patch on my neck i think my football career certainly is over although the tumor was benign plunkett was left without the ability to demonstrate his talent as a quarterback he goes out for football and he's got all these contraptions <laughs> he's got like a neck break. I mean, he can hardly turn his head without it hurting I spent the first week of school not seeing much more than the top of my shoes because I had clamps on my neck and I was walking around school with my head down. He became kind of an unknown quality in that first year and whether he would play or when he would play became a pretty serious question. Although he played for the freshman team, Plunkett's confidence was shaken that spring. Coach Ralston brings in every player after spring training and talks to them individually to tell them where they stand and what they expect and what they want him to do uh, during the summer. And they're thinking of making him a defensive end. And he stood up and said, no, I don't want to be a defensive end. And I said, Coach, number one, I'd like another chance at quarterback. I don't feel I was given a fair opportunity. I came in banged up uh, and uh, didn't get off to a great start. And number two, if you'd move me to defensive end, I think I'll leave Stanford and go somewhere else where I can play quarterback. Then I suggested throwing the ball a lot during the summer. And when other students were going to the beach, you'd take that sack of footballs, go down and throw into a net and make all of the drops and steps and go through the entire offense. After redshirting in 1967, Plunkett led Stanford to a 6-3-1 record the next year. In 1969, he set a Pac-8 record by passing for almost 2,700 yards and was gaining ground as a Heisman candidate. Jim's success, I think, was built around the fact that he was just purely and simply a great athlete. Now, he was not a scrambler, but when Jim Plunkett couldn't find his primary receivers and he needed about eight yards out there and he started to run, he usually got them merely with his strength. He, he'd knock you down. He, he, he ran over defensive players. He was that strong. He was... Um... Probably uh, 
as calm a player, particularly in college, and a steadying influence on his teammates. Jim's greatest asset as a quarterback was the same asset he has as a human being. I mean, uh, he's just calm, he's focused, just a sense that uh, uh, calmness about him. I don't know if it's part of his background or his heritage or what he'd been through, but there was nothing that was going to upset him. I think sometimes from a defensive standpoint, we all thought, well, we could ease off a little bit because Plunk's going to throw a bomb. Established as a national star, Plunkett easily overcame any social barriers that may have existed at Stanford. Meanwhile, a protest movement was gaining strength on campuses across the nation. The Vietnam War was not very popular in those years. Civil rights was a hot topic. Uh, there were fires, there were explosions, there were radical professors, uh, there were sit-ins. Yes, there was a draft. Uh, we were deferred, we were in college. We had uh, at least our college years, as long as we maintained in school, maintained things, we could be deferred. Whether you had a political view or not, uh, you were involved. You were involved in everything that was going on on the campus, that was in going on with the Vietnam War, uh, involved in the demonstrations. The mindset was changing. We all had friends from high school, from outside, that were, uh, were not coming back alive. The only political issues Jim got in Two were uh, deciding where the adult parties ought to be held in the fraternity house or off campus. Uh, Jim, Jim and some of his friends uh, lived a good life at Stanford. Our draft status wasn't something that uh, you know we all talked about, but it was something that we were all aware about. If Plunkett stayed clear of political confrontation, he did not escape personal tragedy. In the spring of 1969, he received word that his 56-year-old father died of a heart attack. He was up at my house when we got a phone call for him to come home. He was just torn up. I mean, obviously, I mean, he was in, in tears. Not having his dad be part of the success was a big pain. A lot of his anger seemed to be the pain that his mom was suffering having lost her mate. Resisting the temptation to turn pro, Plunkett returned to Stanford in 1970, breaking the NCAA total offense record with 7,887 yards. He won the Heisman Trophy against a strong field. That was the year of quarterbacks. Archie Manning, Joe Theismann, and Jim Plunkett, and Pastorini. I thought Joe Theismann or Archie Manning would win the Heisman Trophy going into the season. Plunkett was kind of a cover boy, you know, before that season, but he wasn't thought to be the best quarterback in the country. The 36th winner of the Heisman Memorial Trophy. Congratulations and good luck. Thank you very much. I've had a call from Joe Theismann. He's waiting to hear from you, and I have the number, and I hope that you'll find time to call him back. He's waiting to hear from you. Congratulate you, too. He stands up and he thanks his mother. He couldn't have made it without his mother, who's not there. I mean, for Jim Plunkett to, to draw inspiration from, from someone who never saw him play, that shows real character. With Jim coming to Stanford, uh, he went a long distance. Believe me, he wasn't the Heisman Trophy candidate when he first got into school. In his final collegiate game, Plunkett showed the nation why he won the Heisman. The sight of proof, the Rose Bowl. The opposition, Ohio State. I remember walking down Main Street at Disneyland, and they had the two teams walk side by side. It was kind of a tradition, and I was looking over at the Ohio State team. As we started to walk down the street, I was thinking, geez, those guys are big, and those guys look pretty mean. Ohio State was like an assembly line to the pros. 10 or 12 are going to make it. But Stanford had the hammer. You know, Jim was the hammer. When he hit Vataha on his backside in the end zone, it was 8, 9, 10, out. Completing 20 passes for 265 yards, Plunkett took Stanford to a 27-17 upset of the unbeaten Buckeyes. We went into that game feeling that there was no way that they could beat us. Jim came out and threw some big passes. Jim took that team on his back and just picked us apart. They want to make him a defensive end, and he stands up and he knocks off the greatest team of all time. That game made Jim the number one draft pick in the NFL. In big games, there was nobody better. Jim Plunkett, if he was coming out in the draft this day, and everybody talks about, hey, 
players are better now than they used to be, he'd still be the first player taken in the draft because I think his talent physically was extreme. He had an unbelievable arm. I remember one day we were all sitting around on the 50-yard line and he was throwing the ball at the goalpost. We had a bet on how many times he could hit it. It was simple playing with Jim Plunkett. Number one, he's tall. And he has a very high delivery. Secondly, he had the best spiral that I'd ever seen in my life, the easy ball to catch. Jim Plunkett it was a tremendous college quarterback. He played on a team that was not a great team by any stretch of the imagination. He was a fine passer. You know, he had a peculiar way of holding the ball higher than most quarterbacks. Uh, the ball always seemed to be visible, but he was very accurate. He had a great arm. He's a big guy. In fact, you know, he has a very large head, and they had to get him special helmets. I remember that. You know, I remember watching him on the field and thinking, man, his helmet wasn't big enough. It looked like his helmet was so small, it was pushing his face out of his helmet. Plunkett's head was anything but big after he was released in August of 1978. In just seven seasons, the once golden-armed quarterback was unemployable. There was just one slim chance at redemption. I always thought that the Oakland Raiders, especially as long as Al Davis has been involved, and then they should have that Statue of Liberty right at the entrance to the, to the trainers. Give us your poor, your wretched, your huddled masses yearning to be free. These are the guys who, who were thrown out by everyone else, and I think probably the ultimate proof that one man's junk is another man's treasure. If you live your life worrying about what people think and what people say and who's good or who's bad, you'll never take a step. I believed in Jim Plunkett, always have, always will. He would pick up the people that nobody else wanted, but he saw they could play football. He said, I would like you to come out and have a tryout. You know, I've never tried out for anybody, you know, really. That was really hard for me to do. Number one drafted player in the country, Heisman Trophy winner, and you just don't envision him. Well, come on over, we'll give you a look. My evaluation was there's nothing wrong with him physically. I recommended that we should sign him. Al Davis said, you know, we, we want you, Jim. We really believe you can play, but you just need some rest. You know, just don't, you don't have to compete for a while. Signing a three-year contract for a total of $465,000, Plunkett was Oakland's number three quarterback. His game plan was patience. I remember telling him, look, you know, there's no pressure on you now because Ken Stabler is a starting quarterback. Just learn the system, get comfortable fit in. Jim was hurt. You, you said, you, what, you're telling me I can't play? And Davis said, I'm telling you, you can't play this year, that you will be better just to sit back and get yourself healthy, mentally and physically. I'm in a position where I've never been in. Number one, I had to go try out to make the team. And then number two, I don't get a chance to compete. I'm going to ride the bench. And I proceeded to, quote, unquote, heal up emotionally and physically and get ready to play when my, my time came. Plunkett didn't call a play in 1978, and the next year, he threw just 15 passes. With time running down on his contract, it did not appear he would get a chance to prove himself. After I left, they traded Kenny Stabler, and they got Dan Pastorini from Houston. And Dan Pastorini was the starting quarterback. There was kind of a rivalry between Dante Pastorini and Jim. Dante was this great star coming out of the mother load of California when Jim was this poor kid coming out of San Jose Pastorini. Went to Bellarmine Prep, which was kind of the uh, ritzy school and the, the best school athletically and academically in San Jose. They never hit it off. And then when they became teammates of the Raiders, wow. This really shaped me in the sense that Tom Flores wasn't going to let me compete for the starting job. He said they traded a number one for a number one, a starter for a starter, basically. Jim deserved it because he had the ability to make things happen. Pastorini didn't have the leadership uh, that, that Jim had. Jim was the guy that they could believe in. They felt that he, Jim was a guy that could take us to the promised land. He came to me in 80 in training camp and asked to be released because he didn't think he was getting a chance. So now I can't do that because that'll hurt our team. What really happened? Did you lose your confidence? Well, who knows? You know, we weren't a very good team. You know, we struggled a little bit, uh, a lot of changes. Uh, new coach for the three years that I was there, almost three years anyway. And, uh, yeah. you know, just a lot of turmoil. Nothing was very stable, and it was just a changing situation um, from year to year. Do you think you'll be given a chance here in Oakland to, to start? I don't know about that. I have to wait and see. Uh -huh. If you do, what do you think you could do? What do you think you could prove? 
Well, I'd like to, I, you know, I still feel I'm, I'm, uh, I'm good enough to be a starting quarterback, and that's what I'd like to do before I get much older. Mm -hmm. He rolled his eyes a lot at questions we would ask about how he felt or why he felt a certain way. There's just a certain amount of world weariness that comes over such a man who has already had to deal with a lot of things that are, are really not, not a part of his, of his talent. They're, they're distractions. This is a guy whose personality was uh, very, uh, very fragile. But there's also somebody who always had this feeling that I'm kind of alone. Who can I trust? It's not the kind of guy who's going to fire you up from his sheer force of will. Frustrated and angry, Plunkett watched a talented Oakland team suffer through a disappointing 2-2 two two start. Then, in Game 5, Dan Pastorini went down before a hostile home crowd. When Pastorini broke his leg is one of the eeriest things I've ever experienced in sports because he's lying there on the field and the crowd's cheering. Plunkett comes in and he's the savior and nobody expects anything of him. Finally, he gets his chance. And I do believe that even his own Oakland teammates kind of have some doubts in their mind. What can this old guy do for us? Although he threw five interceptions that day, as Oakland lost to the Chiefs 31-17, the old man would find his 32-year-old legs by the following week. Playing with a team known for protecting its quarterback, Plunkett began to deliver on the promise he showed 10 years earlier. Jim could see the field. You know, he, he stood tall in the pocket. He could throw the ball deep, and that's what we took advantage of. He could drop back in that pocket and stand behind those huge offensive linemen that they had and, and fire the ball down the field to these uh, guys that were rockets on the end, and they'd run under these rainbows and uh, do it on a consistent basis. He didn't do anything different than he did uh, uh, in New England, except that they kept him erect long enough to throw the ball. They had such an image of being an outlaw team, a team of uh, malcontents but they had athletic abilities that, that sort of fit in with his. He could throw the ball a long way. Uh, he needed some time in the pocket. They had a good offensive line. These guys used to tape up, and they looked like they had big old clubs attached to their bodies. And it was fun to watch these guys, especially wearing the silver and black. And they weren't the, you know, let's throw the little swing pass and let the guy, you know, gain 20, 30 yards. It was like, OK, give me time, and we're going downfield. As the Raiders charged down the stretch to a wild card playoff berth, Plunkett performed with mounting confidence, throwing 15 touchdown passes after stepping in as the starter. The thing that he gave them during that whole playoff run was stability. It's so easy to forget in hindsight how improbable that whole run was. Right down to the last Sunday of the regular season, there was still a chance that they weren't even going to get in. And then they get in, and he has his opportunity to play, and, and things just started happening. Coming out of nowhere, it was like a horse race. We were in the middle of the pack, and we just got hot, and we knew no one could beat us. He was playing on toughness and brains and, and just enough physical attributes to get it done. Finally, after all this time and all these disappointments, his ability and his level-headedness began to pay off. He's like a pitcher who may have lost his fastball, but he's developed some other stuff to go with it. He just knows there are certain ways to win. Maybe he can't walk on the water, but he knows where all the stumps are. He knew what everybody was doing on, you know, where everyone was supposed to be and made real quick decisions. So he, I know this ball's supposed to go this guy. He's not open. He's ready to load it, unload it to the next guy. He always looked like he was thinking. He seemed to be a, a student of the game. You know, the offensive guys, they believed in him. Plunkett didn't stall in the playoffs. With upset victories over the Browns and Chargers, he kept making the big plays as the Raiders reached the Super Bowl. In a brilliant addendum to the rich Oakland legend, Plunkett stood tall and threw for three touchdowns as the Eagles fell 27-10. Jim Plunkett had come back from nowhere. Nowhere. He's gone. Who's Jim Plunkett? It surprised me that he was able to come back because I thought physically he, he had been so punished that I didn't know if he could come back, and he certainly did. I just remember the expression on his face. It was sort of like all the years that he went through of pain with the Patriots, with the 49ers, and even with the Raiders in the beginning, it was all worth it. It's not a bad way to end the Cinderella season. Not at all. It, 
but uh, you know, I, I, for a while I thought I was out of football, and this, for this to happen to me this year is tremendous. It's an outstanding year. Your happiest? Uh, my happiest by far. One of the most uh, insensitive, uh, tasteless questions probably in the history of journalism was asked of Jim Plunkett to wit, Jim, which is it, blind mother, dead father, dead mother, blind father? And everyone who heard that just kind of mm, hung their heads in shame to be a member of the profession. The lesser man would have exploded on the spot and, and stalked out, and he did not. I thought he showed remarkable forbearance and tolerance. It was hard for me to go to the bathroom without hearing a, a camera shutter click. And it was no fun for me after a while. I couldn't go out in public because autographs, and which is great, but it's, you know, it wears you out. He was a multi-dimensional guy, although a quiet one and a humble one. I don't think that people understand that. In the locker room after a game, uh, if you'd approach him, he was he would almost flinch from uh, people being around. He, 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 didn't, he didn't have the arrogance to just snap back at you, and he, nor did he have the enjoyment of the spotlight being on him. It always seemed like there was something within Jim that made him a reluctant public figure. We'll be about a minute and a half, and then that long, huh? Yeah. <laughs> he never thought he was anything special as a football player, I can tell you that. He almost apologized for being a fine quarterback. If you see Jim Plunkett in a group of other NFL players, he may be the one in the background. And uh, I think that's where he felt, in a lot of ways, most comfortable until the game started. I think the tolerance, ultimately, of the players on that team and maybe some of the crassness, I think he kind of liked that. He felt he was an outcast inside a bit, and he's on a team of outcasts. And even if they're different from him in the way they are outcasts, I think he felt comfortable. When he first came over, he was a pretty quiet guy. As the year went on, you could see he was getting more comfortable being in the Raider system with the Raider players. The Raiders were pretty crazy back then, and uh, and he was kind of a, the eye in the in the middle of the hurricane. They were hell raisers. They had a great time off the field. That first time I went out with them for camaraderie, I tried to prove to them that I was one of them, and I suffered dearly for it with a very bad headache the next day. If they were going to go into a restaurant and they were worried about getting seated, Jim Plunkett was the guy they'd send in to see the Mater D because they wouldn't know what was coming after him. The Raiders, by that time, had probably the, one of the greatest talking teams of all time in football. From a writer's standpoint, you go in a locker room, and it was like Disneyland. You need somebody to talk to, give you a great quote, tell you what's going on, and they just go from locker to locker and just, it was a fountain of, <laughs> You know, the Howie Longs and the Lester Hayes and stuff, and uh, Plunkett was more, from what I saw anyway, was more on the quiet side. He was very close with his offensive line and most of the defensive players, really. You know, he was a real guy's guy. He didn't try to separate himself, which I mean, a lot of times you see that when uh, with a quarterback. It's very easy for those guys to get separated from the rest of the team. Jim was real sensitive to, to different things that were going on with the team and would talk to guys that needed to be talked to. Plunkett was the kind of guy that, that could hang with him and be with him. He had the, the smarts to, to play the game and to, to be the leader of that group and to keep him focused. It would be so easy for these guys to just go off the deep end and, and break up as a group. And, you know, there were so many free spirits on that team that it seems to me that it would be hard to keep them together. And Jim was able to, to do that. It was an outgrowth of his personality. He didn't try to be something other than what he was. That dressing room had no shortage of all kinds of leadership, some positive and some not so positive. But he was a, a very stabilizing force, and, and he complemented the other forms of, of leadership that they had in the room. If you didn't know better, you'd say, how could this guy be a football player? But he's one of those guys who just is sort of an anti-football player. You know, he, it looks like he ought to be selling insurance in Modesto. In 1983, a season after the Raiders' relocation to Los Angeles, Plunkett was the rock that sparked another Super Bowl run, coming off the bench this time for an injured Mark Wilson. The players didn't think Wilson was necessarily tough enough, whereas Plunkett's toughness was never questioned. Plunkett was the guy that they had one with, and that they, that they could win with. Playing always to his strengths, Plunkett guided the Raiders with talent and wisdom. I think he was a system player, a guy who really fit the mold when he got out there to the Raiders, and they had a very good supporting cast. We'd always tell him, Jim, whatever you do, don't run. Just throw the ball. Take the loss, but don't run. 
because we were going for the bombs. Go deep, baby. Go deep. And that's where Jim went. With Plunkett throwing for almost 3,000 yards and 20 touchdowns, the Raiders went 12-4 and, and advanced through the playoffs in a replay of 1980. The final score, Los Angeles 38, Washington Redskins 9. They have turned back the team that many just a few weeks ago were trying to rank with the greatest of all time. They have turned them back in the most shattering fashion imaginable. Under Plunkett's steady hand, the Raiders pounded the Redskins in Super Bowl 18 as Marcus Allen ran for 191 yards and two touchdowns. Plunkett was, was dominant. His team was dominant. He had thrown touchdown passes to Branch. Plunkett was basically just picking them apart. So many peaks and valleys in his career. I mean, everybody has peaks and valleys, but he had the mountaintop and he had Death Valley. He endured a lot of pain to persevere and to become uh, a quarterback who won two Super Bowls. That's a very short list. As Bum Phillips once said about Earl Campbell, he said, I don't know if he's at the head of the class, but it sure don't take long to call the roll. And I would say that about quarterbacks who've won two Super Bowls. Despite two Super Bowl rings, 36-year-old Jim Plunkett was not ready for a walk into the sunset. The term warrior is one that I'm uncomfortable with because, because football is not war. It's football. Uh, Warriors are, are soldiers who go into battle, risk their lives. But having said that, I would still say that if you were to use the term warrior for a football player, Jim Plunkett would be near the head of the tribe. I wanted to play more. I love football. I enjoyed the hell out of playing. I enjoyed the people around me. I was in a locker room atmosphere most of my life. It's almost all I've known, really. He was on the decline, even though they did win a Super Bowl. and. And the fact that there was a, an, a threat of a Mark Wilson and the fact that he was always being asked, how much longer can you play? You know, he, gr he grew testy about that. It's very rare when a great athlete or even a mediocre athlete willingly moves to the sidelines. In 1988, Plunkett ran out of comebacks at 40. In retirement, Jim Plunkett has remained close to the two organizations that nurtured his talent. Stanford was the biggest thing in his life. He's there all the time. He's there for spring practice, Jim. He's Mr. Stanford. Loyalty is something that, that Jim has always had, and I think that's why people are attracted to him. I know that he's active at the athletic department. He's at every, every game that he can make, whether it's football or some other sport. I kind of wanted to let kids know who go to Stanford that, you know, there are people who care about the university, care about the student athletes that go there, and that, you know, if there's something you need, that we're willing, and, you know, and able to, to, to listen, to help you if you need it. He still wears his class ring at Stanford. You don't see many guys in the NFL or alums that wear their class rings. They wear big cash register looking Super Bowl type rings. He was reliable, he was tough. He was artful when he could throw, and he never patted himself on the back, and he never bragged. Hard work and practice form the central ethic by which Plunkett raises his two children with Jerry, his wife since 1982. Well, I play golf, and according to him, as much as I think I practice enough or I work at it enough, he'll tell me, obviously, it's not enough. You know, you're not where you want to be in it, and you've, you've got to get out there and work harder. And he does that with our children, too. Um, you got to get that mental attitude of, of being tough in order to survive and do the best that you can. If you know Jim Plunkett, Jim Plunkett don't talk that much. He does color commentary now for the Raider organization. I saw one of the shows, and Jim doesn't talk. He still doesn't talk. It's just something about his personality that created that leadership ability and motivated you to, to do what, what needed to be done. So much had been spoken of, of the Raiders and how they've lost their mystique and it's gone and it's, you know, it's not the same. Al Davis was trying to find that mystique again by moving the team back to Oakland. I think almost they felt that the, the mystique of the Raiders was where they played, the, you know, the Oakland Coliseum, the, the color of the uniforms, I mean, the, the logo. The mystique wasn't there, the mystique was in the personalities. 
And, you know, the perfect guy to lead that it was, was Plunkett. When compared to Dan Marino, Jim Plunkett's career numbers don't seem to merit two Super Bowl rings. Yet his place in NFL history is not measured by numbers, but by big plays made under fire and against the odds. Before Plunkett's first start for the Raiders, Al Davis offered some pivotal advice. It's not important that you do well. It's important that we win. No quarterback better personified the will to win than Jim Plunkett. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.